In the last video we've discussed the Nobel Prize in Physics, and in this video we're going to talk about the one in Medicine. Mostly because the Nobel in Medicine is also based on something really incredible and something we're still learning about when it comes to biology of life. And so, how wonderful person, this is Anton, let's discuss the 2024 Nobel Prize in Medicine, which was given to two scientists for discovering something referred to as microRNA. And so, basically, let's discuss what is this microRNA and why it's so important. And here the prize went to Victor Ambrose and Gary Rothkon, who discovered microRNA completely by accident back in 1993. And it actually took almost a decade before their discovery was even noticed or before other scientists realized how important all of this was. And before we actually talk about what microRNA is, let's discuss how all of this started. So over 30 years ago, back in 1980s, Ambrose and Rothkon, whose names I'm probably mispronouncing, so my apologies, were doing research on very well-known worms we often refer to as C. elegans. These are some of the most primitive animals known to us, but because they contain everything we contain, including differentiated cells like neurons, muscle cells and heart cells, for decades now these worms became very important for various scientific studies. And so back then, in the 80s, these two scientists were essentially trying to figure out how and why various cells in our bodies become so different over time. In other words, how can a typical stem cell that essentially contains exactly the same DNA as a lot of other stem cells can eventually turn into something completely different? Why is it that some of them become neurons? Why do some of them become skin cells? And why does everything eventually become its own tissue developing into individual organs? But in order to model this and understand this a little bit better, all of this had to be studied in a tiny model first. And here the initial assumption was that this was probably a result of some kind of a genetic activity. And specifically some kind of a regulation of genes that most likely involves not DNA itself, but instead mRNA or messenger RNA that's used in every single cell to then produce proteins. And just to give you a super quick review, in case you forgot or might have never taken biology, before you can actually make anything inside the cell, our DNA first has to be opened in order to produce what's known as messenger RNA. These messengers essentially contain information required to construct proteins. And these messenger RNAs are then guided to various cell factories that usually resemble something like this, referred to as ribosomes. These complexes take mRNA molecule and use the information inside of it to slowly assemble a protein piece by piece, which when completed folds into its final shape, with that folding, by the way, also being its own topic and its own Nobel Prize that we're going to be discussing in the next video. So subscribe if you want to learn more. But basically this process of protein construction depends entirely on these messenger RNA molecules. But it was never really entirely clear how all of this resulted in different types of cells. And so back in the 80s, these two researchers studied mutations inside these worms that they actually believed contained the clue to how various cells eventually result in different types of tissues. And specifically, they actually discovered an unusual mutation, referred to as LIN4 and LIN14, that seemed to produce some kind of a defect in timing of the activation involved in that protein production. And specifically, Victor Ambrose was able to definitively show that LIN4 gene seemed to be some kind of a negative regulator for LIN14 gene with these mutations producing different types of worms. And so eventually they discovered that this LIN4 seemed to actually produce a very unusually short RNA molecule that was only 22 nucleotides long. But most importantly, this messenger RNA molecule turned out to be not a messenger for anything. In other words, it was not able to produce its own protein and almost seemed to be kind of useless. Yet bizarrely, it was discovered that this molecule was able to bind to LIN14 mRNA and during this binding process actually served as a kind of a off switch. Or in other words, LIN4 was responsible for the inhibition of LIN14, thus preventing certain proteins from forming and thus causing these worms to become different. In other words, this was a kind of a mRNA-mRNA interaction. Interaction that shut down protein production, turning off this specific mRNA molecule. And because this was such a short molecule, they basically started referring to it as microRNA. It was not a messenger RNA anymore because it didn't seem to contain a message to produce a protein. And so in 1993, 
We had that first paper, the paper that discovered something unusual inside C. elegans that seemed to be a new type of gene regulation we never knew about before. But back then, no one actually thought this was groundbreaking. As a matter of fact, most scientists assumed that this was some kind of a mutation or possibly some kind of a mechanism that only applied to these worms. Nobody actually believed this was gene regulation that would work in other species. And so definitely interesting results, but considered to be irrelevant to humans and other animals. And it took seven years to make it relevant once again. In this study, Gary Rufkin and a much larger team of scientists discovered another microRNA regulator, in this case referred to as LET7 gene. But unlike LIN4, this particular gene was actually present in a lot of different animals. And well, it was present in humans. Now obviously those worms had it too, but now suddenly this kind of made it super interesting. They essentially discovered their first microRNA that potentially existed in a lot of different animals out there. And this changed everything. Within just a few years after this initial discovery, hundreds of different microRNA molecules were suddenly discovered in a lot of different species. And well, thanks to this guy, this is when I was also required to buy a new edition of microbiology book that suddenly had the addition of microRNA as a separate super long chapter. So yeah, thanks Gary. That book was like 100 bucks and the chapter took several weeks to study. Actually, no, I'm just kidding. It was super fun. Anyway, this was the beginning of a completely new study in microbiology. And more importantly, it was the discovery of a new regulation of genes through the process of microRNA binding. And so essentially this discovery from worms seemed to apply to everything. And within just a few years, hundreds of microRNA molecules were discovered in a lot of species, including humans. And today we kind of have an idea of how they work. They essentially start with this unusual pre-microRNA molecule that has to be cut first, which then works just a little bit different if this is an animal cell or a plant cell. In a typical plant cell, they almost always match mRNA, attaching to it securely and stopping protein formation pretty much right away. Whereas inside animal cells, there is a bit of a mismatch. And it's actually not entirely clear why this mismatch exists, but to scientists this proves that microRNA molecules evolved completely separately in plants and in animals. In other words, this is such an effective gene regulation technique that it evolved separately at least twice. But they all do the same thing. They act as a kind of an off switch, more officially known as RNA silencing. And interestingly, they are also present in viruses. And so it's quite possible that this is where they originally came from. As you can learn from one of the videos in the description, approximately 7% of the entire DNA in humans, and of course a lot of other animals, originally came from viruses. But the discovery potentially finally explained how a typical stem cell differentiates into different cell types, eventually becoming separate tissues. Basically, microRNA in this case seems to drive this differentiation. Although here other gene regulation techniques also play a role. And so as of 2024, we now know that human genome codes for over a thousand microRNA molecules, all of them important for different types of cells. And all of them responsible for turning off various functions inside the cell, usually as a result of changing conditions or change in environment. And even more interestingly, a single microRNA molecule can actually regulate expression of several different types of genes. And likewise, a single gene can also be regulated by multiple microRNA molecules. And so essentially this is a super complex network that we still know very little about. But all of this began with that accidental discovery inside of these tiny, tiny worms. And turns out these microRNA molecules are maybe even more important than we initially thought. For example, some of them seem to be released into the bodily fluids, including our blood and the fluid inside our brain known as CSF. We don't actually know what they do in there, but they seem to do something. In other words, they don't just act inside cells, they also seem to have an effect outside of the cells. On top of this, one of the bigger discoveries in the last few years was in regards to something known as microRNA 1A3 1A2. This one seems to play a huge role in a lot of things in our body. It seems to play a role in immunity, and it also seems to play a role in guiding the so-called circadian rhythm, or basically the natural cycle inside our body that lasts for 24 hours. And so in the last few years, there's actually been quite a lot of evidence to suggest that even the cycles in our body seem to be guided by microRNA. The study about this is in the description below. 
And so this is actually a much bigger topic than cell regulation. These unusual molecules seem to regulate a lot more. And because a typical organism doesn't actually lose any microRNA, as a matter of fact, new microRNA molecules are gained once every million years, in essence, this also guides the evolution and the complexity of a typical organism. But something that seems to only play a role in more complex organisms, like plants and animals. So far, no microRNA has been discovered inside any bacterial cells. And so this really seems to be something unique to complex life. And so because of this enormous discovery, this is why these two scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize 31 years after their initial discovery. And honestly, a pretty big discovery. Something we're going to be studying for years to come, and something that began with these little guys. And so once we have some additional discoveries about microRNA, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. But we're going to be talking about the other Nobel Prize, the one involving protein structures and protein folding, in the video coming out really soon. Subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.